From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news trends and topics that matter to the business of government. I'm Mimi Gerges. The Urban Institute projects a record drop in poverty levels by the end of this calendar year. Modernizing how the government manages and uses data can inform better policymaking. That, in turn, will improve the lives of Americans. I spoke, I spoke with former Speaker of the House Paul Ryan earlier. He introduced the Evidence-Based Policymaking Act in 2018. Here's a look at that conversation. Paul Ryan, former Speaker of the House of Representatives and former Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. He's the president of the American Idea Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to ending poverty in the U.S. Speaker Ryan, welcome to the program. Mimi, thanks for having me. Good to be with you. You have a specific passion for fighting poverty. Where did that interest come from for you? You know, it started when I was younger, frankly. Um, I grew up Catholic, uh, working Catholic charities as a, as a youth. Um, then my mentor, frankly, was a guy named Jack Kemp. Uh, I worked for Jack on his, on his staff as an economic policy researcher. Um, I've always been enamored in the field of economics. And my mentor, Jack Kemp, um, and a guy named Bob Woodson um, taught me um, when I was a young researcher how public policy can make a huge difference in moving the needle on poverty. Uh, so I've always had just a big desire to focus on this. I spent a lot of my time in Congress on these issues. And I was just raised with this gorgeous idea I call the American idea. That's what my foundation is called, the American Idea Foundation, which is the condition of your birth should not determine the outcome of your life. In a free society as ours, um, everybody has the right to rise, but also we should nurture the ability to rise and make the most of your life. Well, tell and me a little bit more about the, the, sorry, the American Idea Foundation, because I, I'm wondering what the, why did you start it? What was the need that you were trying to fill? Well, when I left Congress, I wanted to still work on the ideas that I'm passionate about. I, I still, you know, I was a policymaker for 20 years in Congress. I, I left Congress, but I didn't leave my, my love of public policy. So I decided to start the American Idea Foundation so I could continue to focus on these issues that are very important to me, and in particular, um, fighting poverty. But what I learned in Congress, and I spent years on this, uh, first when I was budget chair, then Ways and Means chair, uh, we were coming on the 30th anniversary of the war on poverty. We had spent $15 trillion, yet we hadn't moved the needle nearly as much as we should have in fighting poverty. And so I spent a lot of my time figuring out what went wrong, what are the lessons, what are the takeaways? And one of the things, using sort of my economic thinking hat that I took away with was, we weren't measuring things the right way. We measured as a government success in fighting poverty based on effort, inputs, how much money are we spending? How many programs are we creating? Versus measuring success based on results and outcomes. Were we really getting people out of poverty? Were people breaking the cycle of poverty? Were we dealing with the tough issues of multi-generational poverty? And that is where I got very interested in this issue, which, which spawned me to create the Evidence Commission with Patty Murray, and then to write the Evidence Act with Patty Murray to try and move the war on poverty from an input-based, effort-based measurement system to an outcomes-based system where we actually measure our efforts based on results. And it also means that government in everything it should do should really measure itself based on results. You just talked about in the opening about all the data that has been collected um, in, during the pandemic. And so I think this is a good era, a good time for data because people are beginning to realize in society data can make a huge difference and data with respect to government, but especially in fighting poverty, can really tell us whether we're going in the right direction or the wrong direction, whether what we're doing works or doesn't work. And I think it can depolarize the politics of all of this. And that is why my foundation is basically a nonprofit organization, nonpartisan, focused on, 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 on poverty fighting solutions. So we serve as an evangelizer and a connector. We go work with frontline poverty fighting organizations that are doing well. Um, we work with data and data collection to measure and scale and then replicate these things. And then we work with policymakers to educate them about what is happening in their communities 
so that they can t also evangelize about the benefits of these approaches and these 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 solutions. Well, so well, Mr. Speaker, the, let's the let's talk specifics because you do say that you use uh, data in in the foundation measuring results. Are there any success stories that you can yeah, share with yeah. us on 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 data and re reduction of poverty? I, I, I'm gonna have to look at some numbers here. I used to have this stuff committed to memory in my old days. Um, so what, McPhee's a good example. So. Uh, I was in South Carolina with Senator Tim Scott and Congressman Joe Wilson and Ralph Northrum in June, for example. And we went into rural South Carolina and looked at something called the Nurse Family Partnership Program, which is authorized by a federal program called MICVI. Uh, MICVI is the Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Visitation Program. It is one of the very few evidence-based federal programs. What is MICVI? Basically, you pair a nurse with a um, low-income expected mother, and you help that mother through her prenatal stage up until the infant is two years old. You use very rigorous data reporting on these programs. And this program started by George Bush. It was continued by Barack Obama and recently reauthorized by Donald Trump. So three very different presidential administrations, all because of good data-proving results were working it was non-controversial, non-partisan. I was involved in, in each of these issues. Um, the results are really clear. Um, a study from 2019 shows that money invested yields a six to one benefit to cost ratio. It provides $17,000 in savings per family in the form of reduced public assistance. And it improves health outcomes of the mother, of the child. Participants have a likely higher likelihood of graduating high school and lower incidence of domestic violence. In other words, rigorous data is showing that this particular program of intervening and helping young expected uneligible mothers um, at the prenatal stage till two years old really makes a difference and doing these programs with rigorous data make sure that the programs are done well done effectively so this is one example of something that i think has worked really well because of data collection because of evidence and this is the kind of thing that we're promoting with the american idea foundation and, and making sure that the Evidence Act actually gets well executed, which is a law that we wrote that I work on now. Well, so, we're going to talk about that, Mr. Speaker, yeah. but we have to take a quick pause right here and a break, and uh, we'll continue our conversation. Great. Coming next, more of my conversation with Speaker Paul Ryan. Straight ahead on Government Matters, we'll talk about his 2018 Evidence-Based Policymaking Act and why he says it was necessary. We'll be right back. Mr. Speaker, before the um, the break, you were talking about the 2018 Evidence-Based Policy Act. Let's delve a little bit more into that. What is the Evidence Act? Why was it needed? It, it was basically needed because Congress was not evaluating whether what we were doing worked or not. So there really wasn't any process in place to measure the effectiveness and the outcome of our poverty fighting efforts. The Evidence Act does that. It was based upon the commission that said, here's how you do this. Here's how you collect data. Here's how you secure data so that we have privacy protections and cyber protections. And then here's how you disseminate data so that we can use data and, 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 and measure whether or not something works or not. And policymakers can be better informed so that we can tie outcomes to funding so that we can go with what works versus what doesn't work. That is basically the thrust of the Evidence Act. So what do you think agencies need to do to work together to implement the Evidence Act to make it more effective? Yeah, so, so there's four phases of development of rolling out this act. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget is in charge of doing this. So the Biden administration um, has got a ways to go to continue to execute this. But at the end of the day, this means government agencies are collecting and disseminating data. They're looking at the data themselves to see if what they do works or doesn't work, how it can be improved. But also that data is being disseminated publicly so researchers can measure what works and what doesn't. So you can have some real transparency and accountability all the while securing people's privacy rights and securing government data from cyber invasions. So I think it's, it's, a, it's the way of turning the 21st century um, data collection to something where we can focus on what works versus what doesn't. And then policymakers can be better informed. You can take the partisanship out of these things, the ideology out of these things and focus on what works 
and follow the evidence and replicate the successes. That's basically the thrust of the Evidence Act. And OMB, that's the key agency, has basically four phases of execution that they have to execute to, to implement this law fully. So are there any best practices for using data for decision making that, that you've learned through your work at the American Idea Foundation that federal agencies can adopt? Yeah, I'm a huge believer in what we call RCTs, randomized controlled trials. Um, I, I teach at Notre Dame and I work with Notre Dame's Laboratory for Economic Opportunity. We run randomized controlled trials, about 75 a year, on poverty programs so you can really measure what works. So using RCTs and using evidence and then showing policymakers what works and what doesn't work, I think is going to really move us so we can be more effective as a federal government, more effective as charities, more effective as nonprofits. And then the other thing I'd say is removing the silos so that data, data can, can cross uh, over. So you can cross connect data so you can learn from, from these things. That's one of the problems that the federal government has is that we collect data in silos, break down those silos, allow, allow data sharing across different data sets and you can really get some rich, robust research to find out what works and what doesn't. And when it comes to fighting poverty, what do you think federal agencies can be doing better to be sharing data, to be using data? Well, I think it's be executing the Evidence Act um, and having a national service uh, center for data service, um, which is a pilot project that's now being launched, is getting us into the 21st century so that um, OMB and all the government agencies are setting up key data officers, set up learning agendas, we call them, and then data um, um, analysis and data dissemination so that nonprofits, universities can study what works and what doesn't work, and then you can cross pollinate. The whole goal at the end of this is we can look at what works, we can scale, and we can replicate, and we can move the needle. And I really believe that this will help us get at going at the root cause of poverty. This will help us find the right strategies in the right places to, to break the back of persistent intergenerational poverty and go at root causes. And I think taxpayers will be better served. Their money will go farther. Efforts won't be redundant or duplicated or wasted. That's what you get at the end of the day with this. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's been uh, a while since you've walked the halls of Congress. What do you say to current members of Congress today? I actually say follow the data, look at this, and, and make sure, don't be afraid of data. Um, and by the way, in this era of cyber attacks, it, you, you need to secure your data, you need to protect privacy, but there's a lot you can do to learn from data, and you have to really focus on learning from data. That to me is everything. And then fund the evidence. You should tie funding to outcomes at the end of the day as a policymaker, and that's what I think members of Congress should be doing at the end of the day. All right. Well, Speaker Paul Ryan, thanks so much for joining us and sharing your perspectives with us. Great to be with you, Mimi. Thanks for having me.